My speech here will be about, as you see, low-frequency airborne radar surveillance. And this is a topic that we have been involved in in Sweden for quite some time now. That, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is really what I will talk about is the purpose of the low frequency is really that it's a very good way of detecting and positioning objects that are concealed for optical surveillance and also for microwave surveillance. So that means that you can see through foliage canopies, you can see through for camouflage, and uh, you can indeed see objects that are buried into the ground. And actually, you are all get also very good contrast for seeing objects in the open. So also if you have, for instance, uh, uh, targets that are in uh, rough terrain, they can be quite difficult to detect with ordinary methods, but this low frequency radar is very efficient for that. It is a airborne system. It is uh, based on synthetic aperture radar principles. And uh, Sweden is one of the main originators in this. Uh, and uh, as I said, we have a very long experience. Oh, sorry. This we can skip really. What I will say here is I will give you a history. I will describe this phenomenology here. I will give you applications, technology, and describe systems. So if you look at the history here, uh, this started around 85. Uh, it, we, we really asked ourselves at that time why you, I mean, the, the principle here, I shall see what, where I shall stand. So it's new. Uh, the principle here is that um, with synthetic aperture radar principles, you can get resolution that is a fraction of the wavelengths. So ordinary microwaves are microwave systems. They get, of course, resolutions that are very many wavelengths. But really, you can get, uh, with an expand system, in, princ in principle, you could get one centimeter resolution. And actually, if you don't need more than half a meter or something, you can use frequencies that are 50 times lower. And they will give you quite another information content. That was the basic theoretical idea. And it was realized in steps in different systems that we built, the Carabas 1, Carabas 2, and the lower and the Carabas 3 system. It was also so that this started at the Swedish Defense Research Establishment, and uh, Saab, which was previously Ericsson Microwave Systems, they got uh, involved in this more and more and have been uh, have a main role in it since uh, after somewhere after 2000 here. And they are, of course, looking much more into products, whereas the role at FI, the Swedish Defense Research Establishment, was to do the basic research. And I was actually the originator of this Things. I started it in 85, and then I've been with FY, where I was uh, uh, director of the radar department, and then I became a SOB employee for leading the development into products. So if you look here um, on what's happening, I mean, it's low frequency. The, the principle of it is really that if you have a certain wavelength and you look for uh, illuminate, for instance, the ground with it, the response from the ground will be from objects that are of the size of the wavelengths or larger. So that means that if you use a microwave SAR, which has centimeter wavelengths, you get, get response from very small things like leaves and um, fine roughness, small gravel, things like that. Natural objects, they will form corner reflectors, which will respond strongly. Even very small type of corner reflectors will give you a response. So the response can be very complex. If you use lower wave, longer waves, then only larger scale structure with structures will be seen. So if you go to UHF, for instance, that is a, 
sub-meter, but uh, half a meter or something like that. Then you will start uh, to, for instance, penetrate the foliage for the small leaves will not scatter back very much and you will hit the ground. Still, you will get significant response actually from the trees as well. So if in that case, you will typically, as the picture illustrates here, if you have a target like a truck on the ground, you get backscattering from the truck, but it is superimposed with backscattering from, from much structures in the trees. If you go still lower and use wavelengths that are more than a meter, then it happens, which is a scientific fact, where actually have, this has been very thoroughly investigated, the backscattering from the fine structure in the trees gets very, very small. So what you get left from the trees is actually the tree stems, which you see on top of, of, of the response for, from a target, which is because it's many meters long, it will uh, give a good backscattering. So if you just look at this sort of historical uh, diagram here, you can say that what we have done here is really that we have started again using wavelengths that were frequencies that were popular very long way back. And uh, that the reason why they were popular there was simply that because you couldn't pre produce higher frequencies. So you were forced with that. And then uh, you discovered various microwave sources which make you go higher in frequency, but as the diagram maybe indicates here, there is a sort of practical limit to the use of high frequencies because the atmosphere absorbs. And um, on the other hand, what happens was that uh, you saw things like uh, the stealth problem in the Vietnam War, they like to penetrate foliage. There was a new interest for low frequency. And the thing is that it is only with this modern uh, way of signal processing, the digital electronics you use and advanced computers, that you can produce these good images with low frequency, because that is much more complicated than doing it at a higher frequency. So uh, we are back, in a way, at these lower frequencies. And of course, the, what happens is that really a very big span of frequencies of interest to the radar community. So if we have, what is the challenges here? Well, one challenge is, as I said, wavelength resolutions are imaging. And there is a lot to that, because it's not only that you have to do the signal processing right for, the, for producing the SAR images, which is then you use multi-octave bandwidth, for instance. You have to think about pulse compression for that. But there is more important things, and that is really how you produce antennas for these low frequencies that are compact, can sit on an aircraft, and um, uh, will integrate easily in the aircraft structure at the same time as they have the required properties for, 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 for this type of low frequency radar. And then um, you have the radio interference issue, because here we are propagating in a band which is really congested with uh, other uses of the spectrum. And the typical thing you do is that you have a technique of producing notches in the spectrum you use for radar, so you don't interfere with them. But this is quite a complicated and sophisticated subject, which I will, of course, not go into in detail here. And also target detection here, which is due based on change imaging, which is a very important, powerful technique. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, so we can say here that, I mean, typically we are attained with these type of systems, uh, resolution on the ground at the, uh, when we are, have wavelengths that are several meters long, then uh, you have 2.5 by 2.5 meter resolution on the ground. That is just perfect for detecting truck-like targets and so on. We get very good contrasts. You, uh, you can uh, we operate at higher frequencies where we attain sub-meter resolution, still at very low frequencies. You could compare that with the expand system. That would the corresponding ratio between resolution and frequency would be that we obtain something like 
2 by 3 centimeter resolution. This is about the antenna. What we'd like to do, the, the correct properties for this type of system is that for, you can use the SAR for attaining resolution on the ground, given that you can direct the radar beam to one side of the aircraft. So you must have an antenna which operates at low frequency, is compact, it radiates to one side and cancels the signal from the other side. And the, one way of doing that is using this type of, it's like an end fire dipole array. You had broadband dipoles that can transmit the dipole type patterns for several octaves. And you have uh, like the, some type of wavelengths, half of that wavelengths, like a minimum wavelengths in between them. You use them to force to radiate the, the beam to one side. This is a, a technique that we have used for a long time. The first Carabas system was with using these dragged antennas. And they are, this is a, a frequency band here is from 20 to 90 megahertz. It's from 15 to 3 meter wavelengths you use. And um, you tra transmit and receive that from those uh, sacks, which are, have uh, antenna elements woven into them. This is not used any longer. It's just of historical interest. So what system is still around today is what we call push-boom antennas. They are eight meter long uh, spears that are pushed in front of the aircraft. So this has been operating since 97. It's a very good and reliable system, even though, as you see, the antenna installation there is quite an advanced thing. And uh, that is, of course, the main drawback in this. It's not simple to do and get airworthy. So to do that, we had all this type of ground uh, vibration tests for flutter characteristics and so on, both expensive and complicated. Uh, but the suggestion was that this was typically to be used on their large systems, so we could uh, with this type of low frequency system, you can get a system like this would have a surveillance capacity of four or five square kilometers a second. So it will survey the area of Sweden, for instance, in 16 hours. So it's a very impressive surveillance capacity. We have never built such a systems. We have now concentrated on smaller systems. So Another concept for antennas is actually that you can push, put this type of dipoles on the, on the belly of the aircraft. And this is, uh, uh, for instance, the Gripen fighter produced by Saab. We have made this study for, for an integration of this type of low-frequency radar for, for that type of plane, where you have these dipoles poles when they are... Um, in operating position, they are one meter below the belly of the aircraft, which is sufficient to get a good antenna performance. And then you fold them back to get sufficient clearance when you start and land um, in the other aircraft. And then we have a development of electrically small antennas, which is what we use nowadays. So what we do is that we deliberately make the antennas um, uh, have low efficiency. And that, in particular, since we use a multi-octave bandwidth, that means that at, at one end of the spectrum, they have very low efficiency. On the other hand, on the other end, they are quite good. And then we, we do a weighting of the signal and also the noise. To, to, but we can handle that by a power man management system so we can get full resolution at little penalty. And this is uh, the system that we are currently operating, the Carba 3. It's a two-band system using these short antennas. So this, the inverted T you see there, the horizontal member of that inverted T is the low-frequency dipole operating from 27 to 82 megahertz. And this uh, smaller things, they're sitting a bit higher up, looking somewhat downwards. They are... For a high band, they cover 220 to 300, uh, uh, 130 to 360 megahertz. 
providing 0.7 meter resolution. The entire radar unit is a very small, it weights just 11 kilos, sits in between the front seats of this small helicopter. I can show you images now on this. So this is a typical image that is uh, registered with the helicopter system you just saw. It is, uh, shows various things. You can, if you have good resolution, which may or may not have on this screen here, you can see that uh, you see very small objects like uh, humans standing out in the open field. Uh, you can uh, look at, for instance, uh, here is the high band, the upper band, and the lower, which is 0.7 meter resolution. The lower band is 2.5 meter resolution. There you also see this, this typical longitudinal things here, which are power lines, and this is for your fencing around what is what was a, a prison. This is, uh, if you look at one detail on the image, you take this form, and uh, here you can see on the left side, here you, you can see uh, uh, the 0.7 meter resolution, that is 230 to 360 megahertz wavelengths, so you use here around 1.2 is the mean wavelength here. Here is the low band, here is the mean wavelength, 5 meter. And the interesting thing here is that here you see, if you compare with the photo and have good eyes, you can see that this bright dot here really corresponds to a ventilation shaft on the roof of that building. But that ventilation shaft is not seen at the low frequency because here frequencies are just too large for that to be given any backscatter. But you see other structures here. And these are actually structures from things inside the building. So this is quite interesting because that, this means that if you have, for instance, a vehicle inside that building, or if it's there or not there, that you will see. So... Um, and the potential of this type of penetration is not only for foliage, it is certainly for camouflage, but also these other applications. Uh, and uh, this is just to, this is not really so important. I will just point out it's not a good image, but the thing is that you should, the positional accuracy in these images are very, very good. It is sub-meter. So, so you get, well, from the images, you get the GPS position of, 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 of the targets. This is um, fusion between this carabas and the 3D optical images. And they are, uh, that is quite a powerful technique. So what you see here to the right is actually an optical 3D image. So it's computer generated, so it looks a bit strange but it's taken from a mirror system called 3D mapping, and it's a, 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 a moving 3D technique where, where you have a moving cam camera which reconstructs then the, a 3D, 3D model of the ground. And you can f f fuse that model with, with, um, with Carabas data, and uh, this shows the fusion. So this is the same seen with the Carabas. So this is the optical image. This is the Carabas image. And again, if you are careful here, you can see that these little weak gray dots here, they correspond well with various vegetation elements on the ground. But the bright dot there, what you can do if you Zoom in on that one. This is a Carabas image. You take the 3D image and just zoom in that too on that same area. This is the 3D. And then you, in the 3, you use the, the fact that it is a 3D model to look in various directions to that particular point on the ground. Then you can see that actually this bright response from, 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 from on the image it was because, if you see there, which is on a circle by a red rectangle, there is a vehicle standing below the screen. So that vehicle is the one thing that gives the one bright return 
in this image. So as you see, it, uh, this low frequency technique is very sensitive to these type of structures that are hidden below the trees. And that is the reason for that is that is the, the response from the tree themselves is very, very weak. And we can use this for as an automatic target detection technique, which is quite important because surveillance capacity can be very large. And what you do then is that, I mean, as I said, the, the, the main source of the response from the trees are, is from the tree stems. So if you take, that means that if you refly an area and you subtract one image, because the ground position is very accurate, it's like a meter. So if you take an image one day, you subtract it from an image another day, you will essentially get zero back. If you try that with a microwave image or an optical image, there is always all these small fluctuations that you really cannot control, that the vegetation looks a little bit different from one day to the other. And that means if you subtract it, you will get noise only. But not with a low frequency. So that means that if there is a truck one day that wasn't there the day before, you certainly see it. And this is an example of that. So this is actually, as you see, only a small area, 250 meter, and it's with, with all these... Uh, uh, there is some pattern here of bright things, but it's very difficult to trace out if, if it's targets or not. Actually, it's targets, because this is how it looks without targets. This is with targets. And without targets. So, um, if you do a change image, it will look like that. This is computer generated, and it exactly pinpoints the deployments we had made, made deliberately there of targets, which were all concealed targets. Uh, typically, locations will look like that. And if you try the same with a high resolution microwave source system, you will get this image and you have no trace whatsoever of these targets, absolutely no one. So we are also considering subsurface targets. We do also change detection there. It's the same technique that you will see or through the ground, but stones and things like that can be subtracted away. So this is... Uh, a particular technology who are investigating and using polarimetry for this application. The fact in this technique is that the polarimetric signal gives a much stronger return from the surface than subsurface. And uh, there is also other effects playing in like Brewster angle and so on, but they are less important. The important thing is that it's the, 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 the vertical channel which gives the surface clutter return, and that can be used to really subtract the surface return and leave only the subsurface things. GMTI is another application we are involved in. Here we use typically display space and center antennas. The, the application for this is uh, for seeing uh, small targets like moving humans in forest. Uh, which is, of course, an important subject. This is uh, the lower thing here is a typical UAV implementation on the Hermes 450 UAV of this type of system. Here on this system, we are using, the, we're using electrical small antennas, but they are deployed as mo monopoles where you have the um, body of, of the UAV as a counterweight for the monopoles. So you can still operate with a fairly small antenna installation with this, in this application. So if you look at applications here, we have detection of target deployments, detection of targets down to foot soldiers. We have uh, detection of buried objects. Uh, we have civil applications, environmental, forest, industry, production planning, rescue services, 
damage mapping, for instance, illegal farming, policing, border control. Just this uh, concept with Skeldar, uh, the Saab UAV, which is, I guess, on the show here, which is uh, where you actually, you, this is a small uh, rotor UAV, and we have these the antennas you recognize from previous. We used uh, landing skids as antennas for the lowest band. It's perfect, really. This is Nishant UAV, the uh, Indian UAV. Here you have the antenna can be folded as because it's launched by from rail. Is, I will show you. This is uh, typically quite small installation on Shadow 200. So you see the low frequency antennas, they are just 0.7 meter, 0.60 meter there. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hans, for sharing 20 years of uh, Swedish experience. You brought out the ultra wideband uh, system mm -hmm. very nicely for uh, seeing through the woods as well as penetrating into the surface. And if any question is there, one question probably. Okay, everybody is in a hurry. At sea? No, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, because the salt water content makes, I mean, you know, the penetration into the surface depends very much on the soil, type of soil. So the, it can be anything from 20 meters to zero meter, and zero meters apply, applies to uh, salt water. So that is uh, no go. Thank you. Otherwise, it would be wonderful with respect to submarines, I guess. Yeah, one question more, that's all. You were showing trees which are long from, but in India we have trees which are branches also. Will this work? Yes. It's not very, uh, I mean, uh, it will. We have certainly tested that. So, so it's, um, yes, the answer is it will work for those two. <laughs>